Gray Wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountains, a Conservation Puzzle. This introductory video and corresponding lesson are brought to you thanks to the generosity of these fine folks. Wolf conservation in the Northern Rocky Mountains is happening right now, and it can sometimes be controversial in part because there are so many stakeholders involved, and each stakeholder has its own set of values. Each stakeholder can be thought of as one piece of the larger puzzle. So to begin understanding wolf conservation, let's start today by looking at each of these different puzzle pieces. And let's begin with hunters. In many places in the Northern Rockies, some hunters are concerned that gray wolves are killing too many elk and deer. Many hunters believe that this is a big reason elk and deer are becoming more difficult to find, let alone successfully hunt. In some places near Yellowstone National Park where wolves were reintroduced and where elk numbers have dropped, some hunting outfitters have gone out of business and some of those folks blame wolves. Now the hunting heritage is important to many people. It's a tradition passed down through generations. There's a lot of different reasons why people hunt, and after this video, you're going to learn about some of those reasons. You're also going to learn that money from hunting licenses and tags, and from firearm and ammunition taxes, directly funds wildlife conservation, and you'll learn how hunter dollars pump money into local economies. For now, let's take a look at the next puzzle piece. For some people, the wolf is a symbol of our diminishing wilderness. This group is the wilderness advocate, and for them, the wolf symbolizes intact ecosystems. Most wilderness advocates view the wolf from a coexistence perspective, and they don't hunt wolves. Philosophically, these folks believe in preservation instead of conservation. Generally speaking, preservation means no use, and conservation means wise use. You're going to learn more about these terms a little bit later. When it comes to wolves, wilderness advocates believe that wolves have intrinsic value. You're going to learn more about the wilderness advocate after this video. Right now, let's check out the next puzzle piece. For some people, being able to actually see and hear wolves is important and this group is called the wolf-watching ecotourism. These folks want the opportunity to see wolves running wild in their natural habitat. After wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park, wolf-watching ecotourism began to thrive in Yellowstone. It's the number one place to view wolves and people come from all over the world just to see Yellowstone wolves. In many towns that border Yellowstone, local communities rely on the money that wolf tourism brings. After this video, you're going to learn more about wolf-watching ecotourism, why they want to protect wolves at the border of Yellowstone, and how the wolf-watching business pumps money into local communities near Yellowstone. Let's look at ranchers next. Now, there's no debate that in some places, wolves eat livestock like cattle and sheep. Wolves can also pose a threat to pets and working livestock dogs. Now, when wolves returned to the landscape in the northern Rocky Mountains, some stock growers reported more and more livestock losses, thus affecting the ability of some ranchers to make a living and feed their families. So, for some folks who live on the landscape with wolves, Wolves can represent a serious threat to the traditional Western rural lifestyle. You're going to learn more about ranchers later. Now let's take a look at Native Americans. And as with all stakeholder groups, we have to be really careful not to generalize. And this is especially true for Native Americans because there are over 600 documented tribes throughout North America and each tribe is unique. But when it comes to wolves, there is universal agreement among all tribes. They all view the wolf as sacred. Native Americans incorporate wolves into their myths, legends, 
ceremonies and rituals, and wolves are prominent in creation stories. Most Native Americans believe that wolves are an integral part of balanced systems. Today, Native American wildlife managers on reservations work cooperatively with state wildlife managers on wolf conservation. You're going to learn more about Native Americans after this video. Now let's take a look at the final puzzle piece, state wildlife managers. In the Northern Rocky Mountains, state wildlife managers include wildlife agencies like Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, Idaho Fish and Game, and Wyoming Game and Fish Department. The Federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is involved with any species that's on the endangered species list. So, if wolves are listed as endangered or threatened, then they're managed by the Federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If wolves are delisted, their management returns to state wildlife agencies. You're going to learn more about this process a little bit later. For now, it's important to know that wildlife is held in trust by the government for the benefit of all citizens. So governments don't own wolf populations. Governments are charged with the long-term management of wolf populations for the benefit of citizens like hunters, Native Americans, wilderness advocates, ranchers, wolf watching ecotourism, and all other people including So in Montana, for example, the folks at Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks listen to the viewpoints of all stakeholders. They are committed to managing wolves as a valuable wildlife resource. They want to ensure that there are enough wolves to maintain a healthy wolf population. And at the same time, they work to limit the number of livestock killed by wolves and they work to maintain abundant deer and elk populations. Wolf management just like the management of black bears, mountain lions, wild sheep, elk, lynx, and other species, is a balancing act. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks balances wolf viability with recreational opportunities and other public wishes. And just like with all the other species shown on this screen, hunting is an important tool when it comes to wolf conservation. Okay, well, what do wildlife managers use to guide management decisions for wildlife species? Well, the answer is science, and this is all part of the North American model of wildlife conservation, which you'll learn more about after this video. Right now, let's take another look at all of the pieces of this wolf conservation puzzle. Each stakeholder is important and holds its own set of values. All stakeholders have a voice. And while we look to the future, our job as stakeholders is to find common ground and work towards solutions. So that the larger picture of wolf conservation in the Northern Rocky Mountains represents all pieces of this puzzle and all stakeholders are involved. At the end of this video, you're going to participate in a stakeholder meeting about wolf conservation. You're also going to use real-world data from Gray Wolf Research and a GIS to evaluate questions about wolf delisting. First, let's get a little more background information. Gray wolves are the largest species in the canine family. They're found across much of the Northern Hemisphere. Globally, the gray wolf is listed as a species of least concern by the International Union for Conservation of Nature Red List of Threatened Species. In some regions, however, the gray wolf is seriously threatened. Let's find out what's going on with wolves in North America. There are two wolf species in North America. We have the gray wolf and the red wolf. The red wolf is currently listed as endangered and occurs only in southeastern United States, mostly in North Carolina. Now, the conservation story about red wolves is important, but it's going to have to wait for another time. Today, we're going to focus on the gray wolf. Let's take a look at the historic range of gray wolves in North America. In the early 1800s, the gray wolf ranged throughout much of North America. In fact, in the lower 48 states alone, 
it's estimated that there were between 250,000 and 500,000 gray wolves. By the early 1930s, gray wo wolves were all but extirpated in the U.S. So what happened? Let's go back to the early 1800s and find out. In the early 1800s, before European settlement, North America was not an empty landscape. In fact, there were hundreds of Native American nations living throughout the continent. In the mid-1880s, early U.S. settlers moved west. And as they moved across the U.S., settlers and market hunters hunted bison, moose, deer, elk, and other species for subsistence, commercial hunting, and to support the mining and railroad workers. Now, the hunting they did back then was unregulated, which differs from today's science-based regulated hunting. And what happened was, many of these prey species were hunted to near extinction. Now, these same animals were important prey for wolves. During the same time, early settlers were bringing livestock with them like cattle and sheep, and they were converting forested habitats into farmland. Wolves began turning to livestock as replacements for their natural prey. So, to protect livestock and property, ranchers and government agencies began a wolf eradication campaign. Bounties were placed on wolves, they were trapped, shot, and poisoned. And it wasn't just wolves that were being eradicated. Many predators were being killed off. Mountain lions, grizzly bears, black bears, lynx, coyotes, and bobcats. And the eradication efforts and the lower 48 states worked. Because of predator control programs and declines in natural prey species, wolves in the lower 48 states were nearly extinct by the 1930s. In fact, the only places where wolves remained in the lower 48 were in northeastern Minnesota and on Isle Royale in Michigan. In addition, a handful of wolves did still exist in the northern Rockies. Okay, let's fast forward to today. Here's the current range map of gray wolves in North America. And it's generally agreed that there are five subspecies of gray wolves in North America. The Mexican gray wolf is the southernmost subspecies. It's also the smallest and most genetically distinct of all five subspecies. Mexican gray wolves live in New Mexico, Arizona, and Mexico. At the other end of North America, we find the Arctic wolf, which is generally found in areas north of the Arctic Circle. The eastern wolf lives in southeastern Canada, and to the west of the eastern wolf lives the plains wolf. The Plains Wolf lives in the Great Lakes area in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Now to the north and to the west of the Plains Wolf lives the Rocky Mountain Wolf. The Rocky Mountain Gray Wolf is also known as the Northwestern Wolf, the Alaska Wolf, and the McKinsey Valley Wolf. It lives in western Canada, Alaska, and currently this wolf lives in some parts of the lower 48 states. The Rocky Mountain Gray Wolf is the subspecies we're going to focus on. And for the remainder of this video, we're going to confine our discussion to Rocky Mountain Wolves that live in the lower 48 states. In the northern Rocky Mountains, gray wolves live in these five states, with most wolves living in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. Now, remember that in the early 1930s, Wolves were all but extirpated throughout the lower 48 states, so how did we end up with wolves in the northern Rocky Mountains? Let's find out. In 1973, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed the gray wolf in the northern Rocky Mountains as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. At that point, wolves were placed under federal protection with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Now, it's important to remember that the goal of the ESA is to recover listed species to the point that federal protection is no longer needed and management of the species can then be returned to state agencies. Now, after wolves were listed on the endangered species list, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service identified three gray wolf recovery areas. Central Idaho Recovery Area, Northwest Montana Recovery Area, 
and the Greater Yellowstone Recovery Area. In year 1980, the first pack of wild wolves crossed the border from Canada into Glacier National Park in Montana. This first wild group of wolves became known as the Magic Pack, and this was called natural recolonization. Now, in addition to natural recolonization, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began taking active measures to increase wolf populations by relocating wild wolves from Canada and northwestern Montana into parts of the lower 48 states. So between 1995 and 1997, 31 wolves from western Canada and 10 wolves from northwestern Montana were reintroduced into the Greater Yellowstone Recovery Area and 35 wolves from Canada were relocated into central Idaho. These events were called reintroduction efforts. And these reintroduction efforts in the Northern Rockies worked. Many relocated wolves survived, many alpha pairs reproduced, and the number of wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountains started to increase. Now, shortly after wolves were reintroduced into the Northern Rockies, the states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming began developing their wolf conservation plans. And the purpose of these state conservation plans is to serve as wolf management plans when and if wolves are delisted. So this was around year 1996. Let's fast forward 12 years and see what happened next. In March 2008, Thanks to ESA protection and a lot of work by federal, state, and tribal agencies, conservation groups, and private citizens, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service delisted the Northern Rocky Mountain Gray Wolf in Montana, Idaho, and portions of Oregon and Washington. To some folks, this was a huge conservation success, right? I mean, the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolves were brought back from the edge of extinction. But, for some folks, the delisting seemed like an abandonment of a population that still needed ESA protection. So, in July 2008, 12 parties joined together and filed a lawsuit regarding the delisting of the Northern Rocky Mountain Gray Wolf. The U.S. District Court granted an injunction, and the decision to delist the Northern Rocky Mountain Gray Wolf was overturned. The Northern Rocky Mountain Gray Wolf was relisted in July of 2008 as an endangered species in part because there was no evidence of connectivity between the wolf populations and it was determined that the state of Wyoming did not have a sufficient wolf management plan at the time. In 2009, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service delisted wolf populations in Montana and Idaho and these two states had wolf seasons. In 2010, the U.S. Court of Appeals overturned the ruling again and relisted the gray wolf populations in Idaho and Montana. In 2011, northern Rocky Mountain gray wolves in Montana, Idaho, and parts of Oregon and Washington were again delisted, and the management of these gray wolves was returned to state wildlife agencies. In 2012, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service approved the wolf management plan for Wyoming and delisted gray wolves in Wyoming, too. But in September 2014, the decision to delist the Northern Rocky Mountain gray wolf in Wyoming was again overturned. As of August 2016, the Northern Rocky Mountain gray wolf in Wyoming is listed as an endangered species while the Northern Rocky Mountain Gray Wolves in Montana, Idaho, and parts of Oregon and Washington remain delisted. Whew! Okay, what's going on? Are the Northern Rocky Mountain Gray Wolves ready for delisting? Or do they need continued ESA protection? And how do we know when a wolf population is ready for delisting anyway? Well, we can look in the Gray Wolf Recovery Plan. When it was created, it provided a roadmap to recovery with science-based recovery criteria that must be met before wolf population can be considered biologically recovered. Okay, well, what are the recovery criteria and how do we measure them? Well, that's a great question. 
the recovery criteria for the Northern Rocky Mountain wolf population is this wolf population must contain at least 300 wolves and 30 breeding pairs and must be equitably distributed in the three recovery areas within Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming for at least three consecutive years. Okay, has the Northern Rocky Mountain wolf population met these recovery criteria? Well, after this video, you're going to use real world data to answer this question. Well, how do we measure the recovery criteria? Let's find out. One way to keep track of how many breeding pairs there are and to determine whether wolves are equitably distributed throughout Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming is to collar wolves and track them. In order to get collars on wolves, wolf biologists first have to trap wolves. Here's Montana wolf biologist Abby Nelson who's setting a research trap near Livingston, Montana. Here's what the trap looks like. Here, Abby is placing the research trap in position. Now she's camouflaging the trap to maximize the probability of catching a research wolf. The hope is that a wolf will step in this trap and then wolf biologists can attach a GPS collar. Now, in addition to trapping and collaring wolves, biologists monitor wolves in other ways too. For example, biologists use wolf track surveys and trail cameras to estimate where wolves are and to determine movement patterns. And they use howling techniques to call in wolves or to get them to howl back. To track and monitor wolves in the backcountry, sometimes biologists pack in and sometimes they ski in. Biologists also visit den sites and rendezvous sites to determine if reproduction has occurred and to count the number of pups. Here's a little more information about what happens when a wolf is trapped and other ways to collect data on wolves. Montana's wolf biologists face many challenges in managing the state's wolves. <laughs> wolves is pretty challenging because the wolf population has grown really quickly. No, too. So we as an agency are learning too, you know, because we just are new to management. We're only in our third harvest season. We just finished our first trapping season. It's some pretty good wear. Monitoring wolves is a crucial component in wolf management, but the primary method of trapping and radio calling a wolf can be a challenge. Uh, if we get one collar out, one or two a month, we're doing pretty good. But those collars are really valuable. You know, getting a collar in a pack now you know, gives us the ability to monitor the movements of the entire pack. Biologists also use other monitoring methods. One new technique places remote cameras in well-known wolf locations. This allows biologists to learn more in their year-long process. The advantage is, is at the end of the year, we're going to have more population data. And for wolves, it's really a year-long survey effort. So we're collecting data the entire year. Even with these management challenges, wolf biologists strive to find a balance or wolves on the landscape. I think one of the most important things that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks does for all wildlife is try to make a place for wildlife on the landscape. And we're trying to fit wolves into the model just like we do mountain lions and, and black bears and have a season on them. And that allows people to be a part of the management as well. Winston Greeley, out among Montana's fish, wildlife, and parks. You're going to use some real world data collected on wolves to determine whether the Rocky Mountain Gray Wolf population has met recovery criteria. As a class, you're also going to participate in a stakeholder meeting. Are you ready? Let's get started. Step one, first your teacher is going to hand out student pages and real world data on recovery criteria for gray wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountains. Step two, Individually, follow instructions in the student pages to evaluate data using Excel and a GIS. Step 3. Your teacher is going to divide you into six teams. Each team will be responsible for one of the puzzle pieces in wolf conservation. Step 4. As a team, work through the stakeholder pages that are designed for the group activity. And Step 5. All teams are going to participate in a stakeholder meeting about wolf conservation. 
This concludes the introductory video for Gray Wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountains, a conservation puzzle. If you would like to download the free student pages, data sets, the GIS tutorial, and teacher guide that accompany this video, please visit Bear Trust International's website at www.beartrust.org. Thank you.